Do you know at every meeting that Walmart has, they start their meetings out with a Walmart cheer. So I was going to ask you as I start today for you to help me out. And uh, we'll do our own version of the Walmart cheer. And so I'd like you to stand up and I'd like you to clap your hands. Give me a W, W. Give me an A, A. Give me an L, L. Give me a squiggly. Give me an M, A, R, T. What does that spell? What does that spell? Who's number one? Thank you very much. Remain standing. Stay standing. Now, I listened to your Casas Heo cheer many times over the last couple of days, and I thought I would develop my own version of the Casas Heo cheer, and I wanted you to join me here this morning with my version. So I want you to repeat after me. Are you ready? Siete, say, por favor. Thank you very much. Do you know I'm, a, I'm good friends with one of your uh, executives here at uh, Casas Heo, and that's Ruben. And Ruben told me a story, a precious story, that I want to share with you as I start today. And Ruben went to, uh, did you know this story? He went to Canada. And he went to Vancouver, Canada, up into the mountains. And along with him, there was a, one of your competitors, Homex. He had, a, he had a representative from Homex there with him. And the two of them went camping up in the mountains, in, 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 uh, in, in the Rocky Mountains. So they pitched their tent. And as it got dark, they climbed into the tent and into their sleeping bags. In the middle of the night, they could hear a sound outside the tent. So the guy from Homex goes over to the tent and opens it up to see what's going on. And out by the campfire, there's a 900-pound grizzly bear. And the Homex guy turns to Reuben. And as he turns around, he says, Reuben, there's a 900-pound grizzly bear outside of our tent. And what are you doing? And Reuben was out of his sleeping bag, and he was tying his tennis shoes. And the guy from Homex says, what are you doing, Reuben? You cannot possibly outrun a grizzly bear. To which Reuben replies, oh no, I do not have to outrun the grizzly bear. I only have to outrun you. And you know the point of that story is that out there in the business world, you are either a predator or you are prey. And in a company like yours that manufactures a home every five minutes, so while I'm talking here, another home was produced by Casas Hale. And over the 37-year history of your company, you produce 500,000 homes. And in the next five years, you intend to produce 500,000 more homes. You're the number one home producer in North America, in all of North America. 
And that's a, that's a, you have lofty goals. If you take number two, three, and four on the list of home builders in Mexico, your sales are greater than all three of those companies combined. But you know what? Those competitors are just like that grizzly bear. And they'd like nothing better than to catch you from behind and to become number one in your business. And in this presentation today, I'm going to talk about Walmart and what it takes to be number one. And I'll talk about the Walmart way. But you know there's also a Casas Hale way. And, and, and in the case of Walmart, the Walmart way differentiates Walmart from everyone else. Walmart really doesn't have any competition that are direct competition, but they have a lot of competitors chasing them. You too are in the same position. The Casas Hale way says that you make the rules. As a number one provider, you make the rules for the industry. You don't follow the rules, you make the rules. And that's what I'm going to talk about today is how to be a market leader and how to continue being number one in your industry. And so today what I'll try to do in the limited time we have is tell you a little bit about what Walmart has done to become what it is today and I'll also talk about some ideas I think you should use. On the plaque on the wall in the Walmart headquarters, when all of the executives walk in into the office, there is, there are, is a verse of inspiration called lions or gazelles. And of all the different words they could have on the wall to inspire the leaders, these are the words that they look at every day. And it goes like this. Every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up knowing it must outrun the fastest lion or it'll die. Each day a lion wakes up knowing it must outrun the slowest gazelle or it'll starve to death. Do you know it, it really doesn't matter whether you're a lion or a gazelle when the sun comes up you had better be running. And the nature of the business is it is prey and predator and to maintain a position of number one in the marketplace you need to realize that you have different expectations than all of your competitors. Did any of you work for any other home builders prior to working for Casas Hale? Did anyone have experience in other companies? Well, the reality is that the Casas Hale way is head and shoulders above the standards that are required to build 100,000 homes this year. And you need to realize that and embrace that concept to, to help your company to achieve the lofty goals that it's set. I have to tell you about how I met Sam Walton. Sam Walton, when he died, was the world's richest man. He was worth 100 billion U.S. dollars when he died. And I went to Bentonville, Arkansas, and I lived in Dallas, Texas at the time. So I went up to Arkansas in the middle of the Ozark Mountains. Now, have any of you ever seen a TV show, an American TV show called the Beverly Hillbillies? The Beverly Hillbillies? Well, that's what Arkansas is a little bit like. There's a, it's a Beverly Hillbillies kind of place, like in Tennessee. So I went up and I interviewed with the, with the executives of the company. And when I got done with my interview with the chief operating officer, I noticed he was looking over my shoulder into the doorway. So naturally, I looked back to see who was there. And there was an old man standing in the doorway. And he was wearing coveralls, the kind of coveralls that an auto mechanic might wear or a janitor might wear. And for just a moment, I thought it was the janitor. And then it hit me, this is Sam Walton. And Sam Walton walks in, and I'm introduced to him by the COO, who says, with a, with a beautiful southern accent, a southern U.S. accent, he said, Mr. Sam, this is Mike Birdall. And Sam looks at me with this really strange look on his face, and he says, Birdall? as in B-I-R-D-D-A-W-G, bird dog. And if you don't know what a bird dog is, in the southern United States, a bird dog 
is a hunting dog that, that you take out to go bird hunting. And so I didn't know whether that was a good thing or not to be called bird dog by Sam Walton. But if you look at this map of the U.S., the X represents the location of Bentonville, Arkansas. And you might think that Sam Walton was such a visionary in, his, in, in retailing that he located his business in the middle of the country. Because if I asked any of you to come up here with a dart and throw it into that map, it would hit pretty close to the center of the U.S. And you would think that that was set up for logistic purposes. Nothing could be further from the truth. The reality is, the reason Sam located where he did is because there is an area called Four Corners. And Four Corners is where Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, and Arkansas come together at the same point. And by locating his business there, it allowed Sam Walton to purchase four bird hunting licenses and go out and hunt birds all year round. Because you see, Sam Walton's success in becoming number one, he had his company first in his life, his uh, bird hunting second, and unfortunately, his family was probably number three on the list. And I'm not suggesting that's a good strategy, but that's what he did, and he became the world's richest man. So in that moment when he called me bird dog, I was immediately endeared to the most successful retail merchant in the history of the world. As a result of being there, I ended up writing these two books, which, by the way, are available in, in Mexico. One is available, the uh, Ten Rules, and the other is available in Venezuela in Spanish. And what was interesting is when I wrote these books, I talked to competitors who really uh, believed that it was impossible to compete with Walmart. And you know, it's probably true that some of your competitors think that it's very, very difficult to compete with your business design. And that's good news for you. And what I found was when I wrote these books, I, pro I developed strategies and ideas others can use in order to compete successfully in a Walmart world. And as a result of these books, I now I travel the world and I speak at conferences on all six continents at, at, in great cities all over the world. And I talk to, to great audiences. Walmart was started in 1962. And do you know that when, uh, when Sam Walton started Walmart, he almost failed? And you know, many of the great leaders that are out there who created great business models also had difficulty in the early days with their business. There was a man, Fred Smith, who started Federal Express. They told Fred Smith that Federal Express would never work. They told Ray Kroc at McDonald's that McDonald's, the concept, would never work. And they told, as you know from Doug Lipp, Walt Disney, that, that his concept for theme parks was destined to fail. And you know what? They also told Sam Walton that his retailing plan was destined to fail. And one of the things that he did in the early days, when he needed money the most, he went to the banks. And you know what the banks said? They would not lend him money because they were afraid that his, his, his design for his company was destined to fail. And you know the product suppliers? They didn't want to sell merchandise to Sam Walton because they were afraid, unless he paid cash up front, that he was going to go out of business. And you know, the customers also thought he was a bit crazy to build big stores in small towns. And, and, and the reality is, it did sound awfully crazy. But Sam Walton's vision, his vision for Walmart was this. He wanted to raise the standard of living for people living in rural America to match the standard of living of people living in urban areas. And so with that vision in mind, he concentrated his energies on rural America. And when he opened his first store, he opened it in a town that only had 2,500 people living in it. And everyone thought there's no way that, that 2,500 people can support a store the size of Walmart. 
And you know what? Sam Walton's vision wasn't to attract 2,500 people. What others never knew was the Walmart design was to attract customers from a 50-mile radius around the store, which effectively increased the market to 15,000 people around the store because people were willing to drive longer distances in order to get low-priced products in rural America. And so he had the last laugh. And, and you know, to the day he died, and Sam Walton, in the final days of his life, he had bone cancer. He moved a hospital bed into his office at the headquarters so he could lay down on a hospital bed and take chemotherapy treatments while he was laying in a hospital bed in his office. And he used to have a clipboard, and he'd hold it up, and he would write upside down with a pencil on a clipboard, and he continued to work to the very end. And do you know, up to the day he died, people still predicted his failure. And of course, Walmart has become the world's largest company. And so the same thing holds true for you. You know, when you are trying to compete out there as Casa Hayos in your, in your regions, you know, people will tell you that you can't do what you're trying to accomplish. There's a lot of critics out there who are going to throw cold water on good ideas. Your executives are coming up with new strategies that probably have never been tried before in the home building industry. And the first thought may be that'll never work. But you've got to believe it will work. Let the other critics suggest it won't. And so I have some words of inspiration here called The Critic. And they're about Sam Walton, but you know what? They're about each and every one of you that has a good idea that someone tells you will not work. And it goes like this. It's not the critic who counts. Not the man or woman who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man or woman who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But it is the man or woman who actually strives to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself or herself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if they fail, at least fail while daring greatly, so that their place will never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. I want you to remember those words, and I want you to remember Sam Walton's story. And when you go back out there to, to your office where you work, I want you to remember that you have good ideas, that if you'd implement those ideas, great things can happen in, in, your, in your business and in your life. And there will be many people who are will tell you it cannot be done. And I suggest to you, you say to them, get out of my way while I do it. And, it's, and it really is true in life. And I just completed a book that is my new book coming out this fall, and it's all about the critics and overcoming adversity and setting high expectations for your life. And each and every one of you can, can achieve whatever you choose to achieve in your lives. Whatever you want to cho choose to, to achieve in this business, you can achieve. It starts with a choice. Walmart, big facts. You know the biggest fact that you want to know about is Mexico. You know that Walmart's number two market is Mexico, right? Well, Walmart has 1,700 stores in Mexico. Did you know that? It's the second largest market in the world for Walmart. And what Walmart has done is they set a goal to dominate North America first, South America second, Asia third, and Europe fourth. That's awfully bold talk, but that's their, that is their strategy for domination. Do you know how many stores Walmart opened in Mexico last year? You're not going to believe this number. 267 stores in Mexico alone. 
Walmart's in the construction business. They're, they're, a, they're a building company. Do you know how many stores Walmart plans to open in 2011, this year? One store every day of the year. 365 new Walmart stores across Mexico this year. Now you would think that a company that was started in 1962 would start to slow down its growth and start to, start to think more about maintaining what they have. When on the contrary, Walmart is aggressively pursuing growth like you wouldn't believe. And Sam Walton's goal was never to be the biggest retailer in the world. His goal was to be the best at serving customers. His goal was to create a company that provided legendary service. Because his belief was, if he would take care of his own employees, those employees would take care of the customer, and the business would take care of itself. And you know, the reality is, if, if you look at that logo on your shirt, Todo por el Cliente, that's the same goal that you have for your organization. Yes, you're number one, and you'll grow bigger, but you'll grow bigger faster if you maintain a complete focus on the customer. And that's exactly what Walmart did, and that's why I'm standing on this stage today, because many of the goals that you have for this company mirror reflect the, the design that Sam Walton had for Walmart. So don't focus on the, on the on, uh, you, you know, keep, remember sales, remember expenses, but focus your energy all the time on your customer. This is Walmart's business. They're in 15 countries right now, and that's all. There's 200 countries in the world, and Walmart's only in 15, and they're going to continue to expand rapidly. This being the second largest market, Walmart absolutely loves the Latino customer. Did you know that? absolutely loves a Latino customer. Sam Walton was the first one to identify the uh, uncontested market space, the blue ocean strategy, uncontested market space for the Latino customer in the U.S. Because he was the first to offer products and services specifically designed for the Latino customer. Because if you remember, back in the 1970s, when the, when the undocumented workers would come into the U.S. from South America, Central America, and Mexico, they would get jobs after they crossed the border. Where do you cash your paycheck if you've entered the country illegally? And, 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 and how many people do you think that, that crossed the border illegally have bank accounts? None of them. And so what they ended up doing was Sam Walton offered he offered to cash the, the uh, Latinos' checks in his store at a very low fee. And then what he did was he offered wire transfer services back to the country where the individual was from so that they could send money to their family. And then he would have a customer standing in his store with the pockets full of money. Where do you think they shopped? They shopped at Walmart. And so what was interesting was, as, they, as, the, uh, as the families back in the other countries already knew about Walmart before Walmart arrived. And who knows with your expansion, you may end up in, in other countries also, and they'll already have heard of your company before you get there. But that's what Sam Walton did. So the countries where Walmart is entering, they're already waiting for Walmart to come, and they're looking forward to the arrival. How many of you shop at Walmart? Almost everybody shops at Walmart. And the question is, por qué? Why do you shop at Walmart? You have a lot of other choices. There's a lot of other retailers in the marketplace, but why do you shop at Walmart? You shop at Walmart because of the perceived value for your money? That's the reason that you shop there. And you do have other choices. Do you know it's true also with Casas Hale? All the customers that you communicate with have other choices. But those other choices don't equal the value that you provide to your customers. So even though they may go and shop and look at the other home builders' homes, 
They're going to come back to you because of the value that you provide to the customer, which is the same thing that Walmart does. And it's, and it's the reason that they have been so successful and they have 200 million customers crossing their thresholds every week of the year. Every week of the year. There's 6.5 billion people on the planet Earth. There are more than that that shop at Walmart every year around the world. And when I, by the way, I went to Colombia and Venezuela, and I stood on a stage, not unlike this one, with a thousand people present. And I asked the question, how many of you shop at Walmart? And do you know that 90% of the people in Venezuela and Colombia raised their hands? Well, you know what's interesting? There are no Walmart stores in Venezuela or Colombia. But 90% of them had shopped at Walmart either in Central America, Miami, or they went to visit uh, Disney in Orlando. And they all said to me, when is Walmart coming? When is Walmart coming? They wanted Walmart in those countries. And they're predisposed to want Walmart to arrive. A great problem to have. You look at your company, and your goal is to provide superior service to your customers. And you know what's interesting is with a product like yours and with the supply and demand out there the way it is, you could take the attitude that there's always someone else in line waiting for a home. But your company isn't taking that position. You're saying that you're going to provide total customer service and create an outstanding experience for every customer. And you're going to, to make that experience memorable. You're going to make that experience legendary legendary and when you set a goal to have legendary customer service your customer becomes truly number one and it, and it impacts everything you do at Walmart with their goal for having being number one in customer service and focusing on the customer they had seven strategies and these are the seven strategies of Walmart and do you know what the goal of all seven of Walmart's strategies is Every one of them is to improve the customer's experience. Whether it's price, operations, culture, key item promotion, expenses, talent, or service, everything is focused on improving the customer's experience. If an IT department representative comes up with a new technology for the stores, the question is, how will that technology improve the customer's experience? If the human resources department comes up with a new strategy, the question becomes, how does that improve the customer's experience? And the same thing with accounting. If the accounting department comes up with a new idea, what is that going to do to improve the customer's experience? The answer to that question had better be, it is going to improve the customer's experience or Walmart will not do it. Excuse me. How about your company with your strategy? You have, five, you have these five strategies for the organization. Do you know that each of your five strategies is designed for one purpose? It's for the customer. And I don't know if this is a new way of thinking for you as an organization, but you know, you, you heard Doug Lipp talk about Disney and the Disney experience, you know, and you're hearing me talk about Walmart and the Walmart way is all about the customer. Well, that's the same strategy that your organization has is everything for the customer. And it's not just words. You know, it's not just words. You go, well, I went to a conference, and they talked about todo por el cliente. Okay, now let's get back to work. It changes everything. If you don't feel like something has changed as a result of being here this week, then you miss the message. The expectation is you're going to go back and you're going to rethink everything you do with respect to the customer. Everything. And it doesn't matter if your competitors don't do it. Your organization is going to do it. And you know what? Customer service isn't done at a corporate level in Mexico City. It's not done at a regional office. It's done one-on-one. -on -one. You have an opportunity to present your brand and your brand is very distinct and you are a walking 
talking representative of the Casas Hale. There's no choice to change your approach to customers. It's a company cultural directive. And if you embrace that, and it takes, it takes a village, it takes the whole company, it takes the entire team to do it together. Because you're only as good as your weakest link when it comes to service. And you can't let your other team members down when it comes to serving your customers. What I believe you're developing here is what Walmart does with the Walmart way. This is the Casas Hayo way. This is the way you do service. This is the way you do marketing. This is the way you do advertising. This is the way you do human resources. This is the way you do construction. You deal with integrity. You deal with honesty with your customers. You, you, you under-promise and over-deliver. And if you make a commitment, a commitment we make is, is, a, is a commitment we make. And we will follow through on our commitments to our customers not 90% of the time, not 95% of the time, but 100% of the time. When you make commitments, you need to follow through based on the legendary standards that you're trying to achieve with todos por el cliente. Todo por el cliente. In the, in the short time I have, I want to talk about the seven strategies of Walmart, but I'm going to talk more specifically about what you should do. One of, the, one of the sustainable competitive advantages of Walmart has always been price. And what they do is they have a value proposition that they offer to their customers that's unbeatable. And you know what's funny? If you did a, a comparison of prices between Walmart and other retailers with groceries, you'll find that Walmart charges less on the bottom line for 50 items, but many of the items on the list Walmart doesn't, do, charges more for. Walmart does not have the lowest prices on everything. In fact, if you go to the Walmart store that is a, a mile this way from your home, and the Walmart store that's a mile that way from your home, you'll find two different price structures possibly. Because each store sets up their pricing strategy based on the competition around that store. I don't know if you knew that or not. But Walmart turned its price advantage because what other retailers did in their value proposition, they tried to figure out how much they could get for each and every item which is the reason why you shop at Walmart. You know that Walmart is pushing its prices downward and trying to provide you with the lowest possible prices. And the whole discounting strategy that Sam Walton embraced was unique to rural America when he did it, and it had a very negative impact on small retailers across the U.S. because they couldn't compete on price. Because if you have you know, 8,300 stores and you're buying products for 8,300 stores, you get really good prices from the suppliers. The same holds true if you're Casas Hale. When you go out to buy in the marketplace for 100,000 homes this year, or 500,000 homes over five years, you get excellent prices on products. And that's what Walmart has done. In America, they say that because of Walmart's low price strategy, they save the family of four $2,500 U.S. dollars a year. And the, and the, and the reality is they, they do that. But it's, uh, and, and it's extremely hard for others to compete, but you know what? They do. And no, no matter what your value proposition is for Casas Hayo, your competitors will continue to survive and they will continue to compete on some level. You're not going to put them out of business as a result of your strategy. But you're going to bring an inordinate amount of quality business to your company because of what you offer. Walmart's pursuit of value. There's two things that Walmart works on constantly in addition to focusing on the customer. One is growing the top line in sales. And the other is efficiencies. Walmart is one of the most efficient companies that, there, that you'll ever see when it comes to uh, controlling expenses. And that's one of the areas of opportunity that you have is efficiencies. You want to grow the top line and control the expenses. Do you know what happens for every dollar that you save due to expense control, expense improvement, reducing costs? Those dollars drop to the bottom line immediately. 
And what generally happens with companies when they, are, when, they're, when they set their expense strategy, even at the regional level, is they set their strategy against a sales goal, a percentage of sales. And as sales rise, the percentage of, of uh, expenses rises also. At Walmart, what they do, as sales rise, they force expenses down. Expenses never rise as a proportion to sales because the fastest way to expose a weak expense structure in your company is to see the sales drop. And if your expenses are out of control, it'll expose immediately. So when, as sales rise at Walmart, expenses go down, and the same thing should happen here. They pass the savings along to the customer. Let me get this back. My belief for you with, with respect to pricing is control your costs and pass your savings along to your customers. Provide a better quality home for a comparable price, which is what you do. And be a value price leader with the concept of building communities. I will say this with price. If you currently have a partnership with your suppliers for lumber, for windows, for, uh, for wire, for all the things that go into the homes, appliances, form a partnership on pricing because you, you really have a right when you're building 100,000 homes to have the Casas Hayo price. And everything that you, that you, you should always get the price that is representative of the biggest in the industry, which is the lowest price. And that's what Walmart does. They expect the Walmart price on everything. And they don't care what the other suppliers are paying. They say, because of our volume, we want a lower price. Walmart has, it's a huge operation, 120,000 different products. And what Walmart does is it's not a retailer in the true sense. It's a logistics company. And actually, Walmart is more like a bank than it is like a retailer. Walmart makes money on money because of the flow of goods goes through the store so rapidly, they actually sell goods before they pay for them, and they make money on what they call the float. And that's how Walmart makes money. But did you know Walmart sales last year were $419 billion U.S.? If Walmart were a country, it would be the number 20 country in the world based on gross domestic product, larger than more than 180 countries in terms of GDP. But Walmart's profitability is only 3%, which is about 13 billion US dollars. So their, their business strategy is, a, is, a, is to provide value to the customer with a very narrow margin, but they make it up on volume. Here's some ideas for your company. What I think that, it, that you're talking about here today with efficiencies is continuous improvement and developing a strategy of continuously improving every area of your operation. Do you know where you'll find the best ideas for improving almost anything in the company? By asking your own people. If you want to figure out how to build homes more, more quickly and more efficiently, go talk to people who build homes and are swinging hammers, and they can show you how to build things qu more quickly and more efficiently. Leverage your technology. Walmart was one of the first retailers in America to lever leverage technology, and when Sam Walton bought his first technology systems for the store, for the registers, their industry laughed at him. They laughed at Sam Walton for investing in technology. And later on, everyone else copied Walmart's strategy for technology. And what I would suggest is you demand superior execution from your own employees, from your company leaders, and from your suppliers. If your suppliers, if your employees, if the leaders say they're going to do something, hold their feet to the fire and hold them responsible for doing what they say they're going to do. Operate with integrity and demand superior execution. If you're in the field and your suppliers aren't coming through for you, find another supplier that can. Because if they make commitments to you to have product or have lumber or have whatever you need at the site by a certain date, it better be there. And don't let them off the hook if it, if it doesn't. 
culture. In the time that I've been here in Cancun, I learned a lot about the culture of your company. And your culture is, is, uh, is, is really uh, quite extraordinary. Because, you know, the, the key to this organization over the last 37 years and for the next 37 years, the common ground will be the company culture. And it's what, what makes you great. That's what your culture is. It's what makes you different. And when Sam Walton, you know, one of the questions about Walmart is how did he turn people into a competitive advantage? What Walmart did, their culture is the Walmart way. And I remember when I joined the company, the first, the first thing Sam Walton tried to do was to get me to forget my experience from PepsiCo. And he wanted to teach me the Walmart way of doing things. And you know, in your company, as you hire new employees into this company, you need to orient them to the Casas Heo way of doing things, which is different than what they, they have learned in the past. Do you know the most important day in the life of one of your new employees? The most important day is the first day. And my question to you is, what type of orientation do you give them to the Casas Heo way of doing things? Because if you don't give them a solid orientation that first day, they will bring the standards and the practices and the customer service beliefs from Homex or from another company to your company. So you need to invest the time with your new employees to say, we are different and we really mean it and here's how we're different and here's what our expectations are of you as an employee of this company. Because this organization has a strong culture and we have strong values and strong belief systems and when we say everything is about the customer, we mean it. And that's the same thing at Walmart. Take care of your people, your people will take care of the customer and the business will take care of itself. This man had one agenda and if you worked at Walmart today, they have one agenda. And Casa Heo, if you take your, your five overriding mission statements, you have one agenda. The customer. Todo por el cliente. The customer. That's your overriding agenda for the organization. It may not have been in years past. It is now and going forward. And so your overriding agenda is cliente, el cliente, right? Who is your number one most important agenda item for your company? Who is it? Cliente. cliente. I mean, it's as simple as that. You know, the, the, uh, the, the, your company cheer, it ends with, it's the customer. Have your construction sites do the cheer every day when they start their work. It may sound funny, but if you walk into a Walmart store, which some of you have, have you ever seen them do a Walmart cheer in Mexico in the front of the store while the store is open? And they answer, who's number one? The customer. And it's all done. It's, it's, it's the number one agenda, period. And they say in business, if you'll just serve your customers, you'll be doing better than the rest of the, of the industry, period. But what you're trying to do is exceed the expectations of your customers, which requires a higher level of effort on your part. And that's what your number one agenda is. Sam had three values, seven strategies, and ten rules that made him successful. And all of these areas of Walmart with their culture were focused on one thing, the customer. His 10 rules for success, by the way, I'll tell you quickly. I'll boil it down to five. These are the five things that made Sam Walton successful. And you can take these and embrace them in your life too. The first is your passion as a leader. Second, control expenses. Third, serve your customers. Fourth, take risks, manage risks. And fifth, there were six different rules about the treatment of the people that work for your company. 
Six of Sam's rules are about the treatment of your own employees. If I'll just talk about risk for just a second, did you know that Sam Walton said that when he took risks in the early days, nine out of ten times he failed? The, the world's richest man, nine out of ten times he failed. But you know what he said? It was that one time out of ten when I succeeded that made all those failures worthwhile. But he had a high tolerance for risk and a high tolerance for, for trying something new. And if you want to be number one in your industry with the goals that you have, you have to have a tolerance for risk. You have to be willing to change. Do you know there's three kinds of people in your company when it comes to change? 20% of your, of your entire team will adapt to any change immediately. They're on board. They're with you. 60% need to understand the change a little bit better, but they'll come along immediately thereafter. So 80% of your people will be on board with whatever change you implement. But you know that other 20%? There's the last 20% that fights change tooth and nail. They will fight change to the very end. They don't want to change, and they'll try to wait it out. And I'm going to ask you a question to, to look into your own heart. As you look at change in your company, which group do you fall into? Are you on board immediately? Are you in that top 20%? Are you in the second 60% that comes along shortly thereafter? Or are you dragging your feet and you're in that last 20%? Because the reality is, as leaders of this company, you don't have a choice but to get on board with the change in the organization. Because the goals are too steep, it's too high, you're trying to achieve too much, and you have to be 100% committed in order to succeed. And what comes out of your mouth is all that your employees hear. And what they need to hear from you is commitment, commitment, commitment. They don't need your personal opinions if, if their personal opinions disagree. They need to know you're committed to the strategy of the company, period. You have no choice to achieve lofty goals. And that's what Sam Walton did. Sam referred to his employees as business partners. He created a relationship where the employees of the company were, were as, as important as the executives. And what he did was interesting. He took the organizational pyramid the traditional pyramid where all the executives were up here and all the salespeople and the, and the field people were down here and he flipped it over and he made the people in the field the most important people in the organization the salespeople, the construction people, the people in the field I ask you a question, when was the last time you were out in one of your developments? When was the last time you spoke with a customer? When was the last time you spoke to someone who was swinging a hammer, pulling wire, putting a roof on a house? Have you been out there and have you swung a hammer? Because if you were out there five years ago, the business is different today. It's not the same business. It changed. And you need to be close to the customer. You cannot build homes in, in northeastern Mexico from Mexico City. You have to go there. Sam Walton had a belief that you cannot merchandise the world from Bentonville. And he had an empty office philosophy where he, all the executives left Bentonville every Monday and went out into the market. All the rest of the headquarters people went out once a year to the market to go out to, to visit the stores. And my recommendation is that when you're out and about, go and visit your developments, every one of you. If, if, if I were back here next year and I said, how many of you went to visit developments in the last year, 100% of hands should go up. Because if you're making recommendations to improve customer service out there, how can you do it if you haven't been out in the business? So I challenge you to get your people out there to understand what the real issues are in the field and make sure that you're, 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 you're right on when it comes to uh, knowing your customer. Sam called his customers friends or neighbors. It was a unique way of approaching people. He called his suppliers vendor partners. 
when you have a vendor partner, you have a different relationship. If, if you have someone that sells you windows, Casas Heo is not the customer. They think that way, but that's not true. The customer is the client. And in a true business partnership between you and a window company, the two of you are serving that customer. And until that customer is satisfied, Casas Heo isn't satisfied, and neither should the, the supplier. And when you have that true vendor partnership, there's an ownership that that company, that your supplier, takes right to the point that that front door is open for the first time and you're handing the keys over to that client that now owns a home. And that's the partnership. And it's not, you know, a, a we-them relationship. It's us. And, and a vendor partnership is a special relationship. And it's a higher level of relationship. And if you really want to serve your customers, if the, 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 the vendors have to get on board with your customer strategies. They have to adapt to your strategies. Walmart made its suppliers adapt to Walmart's strategies. They didn't care what Kmart was doing. Walmart had higher standards, and so do you. You have a right to go to your suppliers and say, we want to form a true partnership in the truest sense, and it's going to change everything about the way we work together. And we, you need to have the same high expectations for service that we do. And until we do, we're not in sync. In your, in your culture, communicate your primary mission of service. How often should you talk about service to your teams in the field? How about every day? How about often? Every meeting? Talk about service every day. That's why Walmart does a cheer every day in every store. Focus on that customer. Drive your decision making downward and empower people to serve customers at the lowest level. And, and that's the key to success at the great companies. They, they allow the people that are closest to the customer to make decisions that sometimes might cost the company some money in order to serve the customer correctly. And you know, Sam Walton had a museum in Bentonville, Arkansas, where he had put merchandise that had been returned to him. And in the museum, there's a glass case, and in the glass case is a golf club. And the golf club is bent in half, where the, where the, the, the golfer had taken the golf club and wrapped it around a tree. And the customer came back with the golf club and said, my golf club is broken. And Sam Walton said, I'll never forget this, he said, what would you like us to do? And the customer said he wanted a new one. And you know what Sam Walton said? Do it. Go get your new one and you can have it. And that was the culture of Walmart. If, if the, it was empowerment, pushing decision making down and making decisions on behalf of the customer. As a company representative, looking out for the customer. Even, even more so than you do for your own company sometimes and making decisions. Did, was that customer dishonest? Yes. They should not have asked for a new golf club. They broke the golf club intentionally. But Sam Walton said, I am going to satisfy my customers, period. And that sits in the museum today as an example of great service. And what Sam did with service is he held up individuals like you did last night as heroes. And he held people up as examples because you know what? If you can find an example in the field of someone doing something special for customers, Sam Walton had a belief, if one employee can do it, all of them can do it. So if you can find one employee that can achieve at a high level, you can expect all of your other employees to achieve at that same level. And that's the culture of Walmart. Key item, the products at Walmart. Walmart uses an outside-in approach to product selection and services. And you know, the same lesson holds true in your business. If you want the answers to how to better design communities and homes, go talk to your customers. Your customers will bring you, take you right to the answer. And that's why you can't make decisions from Mexico City for the communities. You need to go out to the communities and ask the customers what they want. 
And you could ask them about everything. What kind of retailing do you want? What kind of products do you want in the retail stores? What is important to you in schools, in parks, in, in whatever you're going to do for the community? But get, the, get them involved before you build. Get them involved as you build. And get them involved after you build with community groups. But, the, but it makes the answers that you need so easy if you just go out and ask your customers. And that's what Sam Walton did with his products. He required everybody in the company to think like a merchant. Everybody in, the, in, in Walmart, myself included, if I was asked what I did for the company, I was a merchant. I was a retailer. And all I did, I, fo I focused on improving the customer's experience. Each and every one of you has a job title. But I suggest to you, your number one title is some aspect of serving the customer. And I also am in charge of construction, or I'm also in charge of purchasing, or I'm also in charge of human resources and people. But your primary role is service. And each and every one of you has a service hat that's the most important hat you wear. That's the change of the Casas Hale way that you're going through right now that will continue to make your company great. Walmart did, they actually, they actually taught us at meetings like this with the top 500 people, they would get the buyers to teach us how to select products for the stores. And they would, they would show the new merchandise to the top 500 across the whole company. And we got a chance to see what was going in the stores and understand what our philosophies were for serving customers. And, and, it, and we did it every Saturday of the year. These vendor partnerships. The, the, the reason Walmart's prices are so low is in those partnerships with their suppliers, there's three kinds of suppliers. And this is interesting. Those that make money selling products to Walmart, those that break even selling products to Walmart, and those that lose money selling to Walmart. And there are actually many, many companies that, that lose money selling to Walmart. In Mexico alone, there's 20,000 Mexican companies that supply Walmart with products. And many of those companies are breaking even, or they could even be losing money in the transaction, because there's so much pressure on price at Walmart. And that vendor partnership is a special relationship. Walmart shares all of its profit and loss data for the products for that supplier for each and every individual store. All of the, all the confidential information that the company generates. And the belief is, if the this is Sam's belief, if the supplier were to leak that information to, the, to other retailers, what are they going to do about it? So what he did is he shared information with the suppliers. He shared information with his own employees. He took the, the, the in your case, it would be analogous to taking the P&L for a community and having a meeting with the employees and explaining to them all of the, the goals that you have and where you are and where you're ahead and where you're behind. Because if you want your team to help you, they can't help you unless they understand the, the, the good side and the bad side of the business, and that involves communication. And so Walmart communicates the profit and loss statement for every store to every employee in that store. And they understand how the business operates, and because they do, they can help the company to improve in areas it needs to improve. The product mix. Walmart manages its business like it's a small company, and the way that they do that is they use their culture and what the company does is it empowers its local managers to have decision-making authority at the store where you shop. And they run that store like an, like an independent entrepreneur. They have decision-making authority to, to do what's necessary to take care of their customers for that store. You can do the same thing in your communities. You can push more responsibility down at the, to the people closest to the community to make decisions that benefit that individual community. My ideas for you for, for, uh, for product are provide a product with superior value, and you do that. Your product is, is second to none in the home building industry. 
And that's why you're such a sought after a home builder for the most important purchase that people make in their lives. Owning a home. I just wish I could be there to watch you hand the keys off to that family that is getting a home for the first time that thought they would never get a home in their lifetime. And maybe their mother and father didn't have a home and they rented. And to see that exchange of that key, the sim- symbolism of that, it, it's, a, it's powerful. What you're doing for, for Mexico and for the, the, the people of Mexico is, is, a, is a wonderful thing. Providing them with, we call it in the U.S., the American dream. This is, the, this is the, uh, the, the, the Mexican dream of home ownership. And it's, it's a big deal, and you're lucky to be able to have that opportunity. And when you do, that's the times you really do connect with the customer more than ever before is when you see the results of all of your efforts. Expenses. Walmart's success is driven by one half sales and the other managing expenses. I can't even emphasize enough how important it is for you to manage expenses in your organization and create efficiencies with everything that you do. Walmart goes so far, everything that they, they, they uh, manage, they are tight-fisted when it comes to managing money and expenses. If you take a sheet of paper, I'll give you an example of a sheet of paper, Walmart requires that every single sheet of paper that's used, if it's done being used, they put an X through the side that's used, and they flip it over, and they use the other side of every sheet of paper. Now, that sounds a little bit, that's, that's pretty aggressive. That's, wow, that's a lot. But if you have 2.3 million employees all using paper today, that's a lot of money. If you have 40,000 employees at your company all using paper today, you theoretically cut your paper cost by 50%. The bigger value is this. When you worry about the, the, uh, the, the, the pennies, the nickels, and the dimes, you send a message to everyone else that controlling expenses is important. And next to serving customers, think about the last time you spoke with your team about managing cost and managing expenses. At Walmart, the leaders are fanatical about managing expenses, and you should be too. You have a right to do that, and you have a lot of opportunities for lowering the expenses of the company, and you should do it every way you can. Figure out opportunities to talk to your employees about increasing sales, improving service, and lowering expenses all the time. I mean, and and, and if they don't hear it from you, who are they supposed to hear it from? This lady, have you ever seen a greeter at a Walmart store? You know the person that walks up to you and they have a balloon and they they hand it to your your children, right? Well, this person was actually an idea that came from New Orleans, Louisiana, in a a little, uh, in an area called Gretna, Louisiana. And Sam Walton walked into one of the stores one day and standing in front of him was a greeter. And None of the Walmart stores had greeters at that time. And Sam ran over to the manager and said, what's the story on this greeter? And the store manager said, we're having a problem in this store with theft. And what we did is we put this individual in the front of the store to greet the customers and to keep an eye on retail theft. Now, you don't know this, but that person's primary job is to secure the front door of that store to make sure people don't walk out with merchandise. But to you, you see that individual as a greeter. When Sam Walton saw that at one store, by the next week, he implemented the greeter strategy across the entire chain. My point in telling you that story is this. You, too, have opportunities like that in your business where someone has a good idea at a single location that you should be taking advantage of. And one of the best ways to come up with great ideas is imitation. And Sam believed in imitating good ideas. Imitating good ideas of his own company 
and imitating good ideas of his competitors. Because ideas are free, and they're easy to implement. And you can look for ideas to solve almost any problem in your business by looking out into the field in your own organization. And that's what Sam did. Expense control. How many of you negotiate some contracts of some kind? Or I'll say it a different way. How many of you purchase anything for the company? I don't care if it's pencils and pens. Do you purchase things for the company? At Walmart, we all purchase something. Okay, we, we, in every job, all of us had purchasing responsibility. Many of us didn't have big purchasing responsibility and big dollars. But each of us had a responsibility to go to the vendors and ask for the Walmart price. And when they laid out the price sheet in front of us, we said to them, we don't care what you're charging everyone else. We want the Walmart price, which is always lower. And, and if what we would say is, if you can't provide us with a lower price, we will go to another supplier who can. And it was, it was really an aggressive strategy. It's not just the purchases of lumber and wire and windows. Those need to be controlled, and they are controlled probably very well. It's the purchases of everything that you buy should be negotiated. Negotiate everything. I don't care what price they put on that contract, you ask for your price based on volume because you have an advantage. When you have economies of scale and you build 500,000 homes over the next five years, you have a right to ask for price concessions. You have a right to dictate the terms of payment. You just, you just make the choice to do that. And your suppliers will tell you that nobody else does that. And, and your response can be, well, they're not cost of sale. We, we negotiate on behalf of our company based on the volume that this company purchases, and we expect a lower price on everything. I'll guarantee you that the, the next time you make a, con a purchase on behalf of your company, remember what I said and ask for a lower price, and I'll bet you nine out of ten times you'll get it by simply asking. Then make that a practice of asking all the time. And be known as a company that is very thrifty. And, and what's wrong with being known as a company that's tight with a dollar? Tight with a peso. Be known as that kind of company. Because that's where you get your efficiencies. In everything that you do. As your volume rises, make sure that your expenses are dropping as a percentage all the time. As leaders, when you're out in the field, lead by your own example. Make sure that you're talking about expense control every day with every, with every purchase that's made out there in the field. And then what your company has done is copied a bit of the Walmart model and you pass those savings along to the customer. The one thing that I don't have here that I'll mention is Walmart demands the suppliers to continually lower their expenses, to figure out ways to cut costs in, in their side of the business so that they can partner to pass savings along to the customer. That's a foreign concept to a lot of suppliers. They don't, they don't understand the, the, the partnership that I'm talking about that you need to have with your suppliers because it's not just the people in this room that need to focus on expenses, it's every one of your suppliers in their relationship with you. How they deal with everyone else is their problem, but how they deal with you is your problem and you have control over that and you can tell them we want you to find ways to cut your costs every year and reduce the invoice we receive each year as you as you continue to give us volume we always want to see the price you charge us go down per unit always and don't routinely accept price increases stop push back and say, I'm going to test the market. I'm going to go test to see what others can supply the same product. Hold the line. I'm telling you that suppliers are not used to companies that will stand their ground in negotiations. And each and every one of you has an opportunity to affect the bottom line. And talent. What Sam Walton did is he hired average people and he got above average performance. 
And it was really uncanny. In Bentonville, Arkansas, when he started the company, all he had were farmers. He didn't have any retailers to hire, so he hired people off the farms that were average, and he, and he taught them the retail business. And he had a, a, uh, a, a saying called Hecate. And Hecate was actually a, is part of the folklore of Walmart. And Walmart had a Hecate song and a Hecate dance. And it actually, they, they actually had a, uh, a tom-tom drum that they would play as they would sing the Hecate song and do the Hecate dance. And if I had more time this morning, I'd bring some of the executives up and we'd do the Hecate song and dance, but, but we don't have that kind of time this morning. But Hecate is, is uh, an acronym that stands for high expectations are the key to everything. And in your company, when you're setting standards for, for any area of your operation, you don't set high expectations for many things or some things or a few things. You set high expectations for everything that you do. And you hold people responsible. I'll give you an example. If you ask in most companies, if an employee walks up to you and they say, well, boss, you gave me two jobs to do. I have this job and I have this job. Which do you want me to do? I can't, you know, what am I going to do? Most supervisors will say, I'll take this one away. You do this one. The correct response from now on from you should be, I expect both. High expectations. I want both. If you set goals and, and for your part of the operation, you set your goal here, right? And if your employees are performing here, if you have high expectations, you force the performance up to meet the, the performance bar that you set, right? Well, you know what happens very often in business, and, and leaders are responsible, when the goal is here, and the performance of the individuals is here, there's another way to close that performance gap. And often this happens where the goal is dropped to match the actual performance of the people in the work group. And if you find yourself being that kind of a supervisor where you're lowering the bar, accepting excuses for non-performance, if that happens to you, you have become part of the problem. You have a responsibility as leaders to hold the standard firm and make the work groups and the people meet those goals. The first thing you could say is, well, we have to build 100,000 homes this year. Well, it wouldn't be too bad if we only hit 93, 93,000, you know, what's wrong with that? No, the standard's 100,000. Now we have to work to get to 100,000. There's no choice. In fact, our goal, if our average time to build is, I don't know what the average time to build is, but let's say it's 30 days to build a home. We want to get it down to 28 days, not 32. We want to raise the bar, not lower it. And if you find yourself lowering the bar for your work group and accepting excuses for non-performance, You've met the enemy, and it's you as a leader. You have that responsibility to hold people accountable using high expectations for everything that you do. Because you know what? Your boss holds you to high standards. Your boss doesn't let you make excuses for not performing. Your boss expects you to achieve the goals of the company. And you have a right and a responsibility to, to require your team to also respond using high expectations. And there's a great standard that you can set for the company, Hecate. The talent pool in Bentonville, he hired off the farm. 75% of the people were promoted from within. And the Walmart way is most important. When you hire people for your company from now on, the Casas Heo way is the most important way. Sam Walton believed in hiring people who had the right attitude and he would teach them the skills. Okay? So he, he would go hire people that, that didn't have the skills intentionally. 
he would intentionally go out and find people that didn't have the uh, retail experience, so they didn't bring bad habits. And your responsibility is to find people that have a good attitude to adapt to your business, to serve customers, and hopefully they can swing a hammer and they can pull wire and they can do the things you need for them to do out there in the field. But hire for attitude and teach the skills. If you have people who aren't performing, if that bar is dropping, deal with your non-performers. You know why you have to deal with your non-performers? Because you have to give your good employees, the good performers, a reason to continue doing a good job. And finally, service. What importance is placed on service at Walmart? The focus of every strategy at Walmart is service. And they have a strategy called internal customer service. Do you know what internal customer service is? It's the level of service that the people in this room provide to one another. And it's my belief, if you want to have a superior service in the field with your clients, this group of people here needs to serve one another in the same manner. And if someone comes to you and they say they need your help and they're a member of your team, you have to, you have to do whatever you have to do to help them. At Walmart, they had this almost, it was like the three musketeers. It's all for one and one for all. And if somebody from one of the departments in Mexico City needed help from someone else in a department in Mexico City, they'd ask for help, and the person would say, what do you need, and when do you need it? In many companies, when you ask someone else for help, they say, I'm too busy, they tell you excuses, they, they tell you how they can't help you. It, when you have superior internal customer service, people help one another to succeed. It's one agenda, and it's one team. And if you find yourself making excuses to your fellow team members about, about why you can't help, you need to rethink your strategy about internal customer service. If you'll focus on this area to make sure that everyone here is helping one another to succeed, what happens is you create synergy. And when you create those synergies, you take the company another level up when it comes to serving your external customers. Sam believed in, in, uh, in service to the point that he believed that 99.9% .9 of customers are honest. Even that guy with the golf club, he believed he was honest. He had to. He didn't write his customer-related policies based on dishonesty. He, he wrote his customer-related policies based on honest customers. He believed the customer is the boss. Do you know when that customer that you're talking to and you're serving, that, that is the individual that writes your paycheck. That's the individual that pays the bills at Casas Hales. They're the boss, and they can choose to spend their money elsewhere at another home builder, and in effect, they fire you. That's one of the reasons why you have to take the philosophy, our customer is our boss. And I wouldn't have a paycheck if it weren't for that customer. And finally, drop everything for your customers. If you come within eyesight of a customer, stop what you're doing immediately and assist the customer every single time. And I'm talking about the external customer and the internal customer. If you have someone from your company that needs help, stop what you're doing and help them. And see what you can do to, to help them to solve whatever problem they're having. But it's called drop everything to serve your customers. You know, I wish we had more time to talk today. We talked about the, the, the Walmart way and the Casa Hale way. And there's very many similarities between the seven strategies of Walmart and the five missions that you have as a company. And, you know, to close out today, you know, the, the reality is you need to focus everything you do on the, on the client. And I want you to stand up one more time with me. And I want you to repeat after me. Are you ready? Hey, oh. Casa Heo, Puro Port La Cliente. <clears throat>
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.